doctors owning chains of hospitals. Yes. It's inherently a conflict of interest situation. Doctors should are scientists primarily. Hmm. Primarily doctors are caregivers. But the same person delivering care, the same person owning the hospital, the same person buying the drugs, the same person deciding bills is, is a daily conflict of interest. What we've done is this. We have allowed a big private sector because, you know, this, therefore the state does not have to deliver. The private sector is delivering. We allowed it in an unregulated fashion and now it has grown to a point where it sort of bites back. There is an ideology at work which is very unfortunate, which is that because this is a public hospital, you will get poor hygiene, filth, uh, your fans may not work, you, people will treat you rudely. Do you advise as a patient that I spend time on Google sort of understanding what I'm going through a little better? A large number of doctors, you know, a patient who is, starts asking questions is a surprise. A patient who is sort of looked at Google and asked the right questions is even it's more worrying. Helpful. Is even more worrying because you know my monopoly on information is yes. slowly reducing. Right. So actually, it's insecurity. Does reservation in healthcare training and medical colleges improve representation, which is what it was meant to do, or does it hurt merit? I'll tell you about my batch. So let's say there were around uh, maybe roughly about 40 at that time, at that time the, the numbers were small, uh, of students who came in through uh, reserved category. And then we had students who, who came in through the sort of, you know, merit. So now many of them did exceedingly well in, uh, in medicine, but today they are in the US and Europe. So on the other hand, on the other hand, and there, I have data for this. Okay. Those from the reserved sections with very few exceptions are working here. Many of them are working with in their own corporation, own in their own environment. Yes. So what is more relevant to us? What is more relevant to our people? Often doctors say that, look, we do receive some form of gifting and support from the pharma companies, but we don't get influenced. Mm. But actually the evidence up to now clearly shows that they do get influenced. My guest today is Dr. Sanjay Nagral. He has 30 years experience as a surgeon and he's the head of the department of surgical gastroenterology at Jaslok Hospital. But the reason why I'm speaking to him is a little different from that. He is also on the editorial board of the Indian Journal for Medical Ethics. He has regularly written columns about medical ethics and our entire hospital system in the newspapers. We're going to talk about many interesting things. We're going to talk about hospitals overcharging patients, the conflict of interest when doctors tell you to buy medication that's more expensive when there's a cheaper option available, whether or not COVID is causing heart attacks and several other things. It's a fascinating discussion. I do hope you'll watch through. Dr. Nagral, thank you so much for trekking all the way to have this conversation. I know it's quite a, quite a long drive. But welcome to my home studio. You've done a lot of work in the field of medical ethics. And it's a space, interestingly, people have started talking about a lot more after COVID because it was only in COVID that the government started paying attention to the fact that how much are hospitals charging for a day in the ICU, the inflated bills, the medicines that were only available in some places, the sort of uh, uh, all of those challenges of conflict of interest, people started to pay attention to after COVID. And until then, nobody asked those questions. And I'm going to come back to why we don't have an adequate sort of uh, regulatory structure for this. But I want to start with the low hanging fruit of medical ethics, if I may. Um, and that the biggest controversy we've come across recently is the Dolo controversy. And I think it's a good example to illustrate, you know, the largest the problem. The Supreme Court was told by an NGO that um, the makers of the medicine Dolo 650 had distributed, and I quote, 1,000 crore rupees worth of freebies to doctors to incentivize or to get these doctors to start prescribing Dolo instead of other things. So even today, when someone has a fever, we're told Dolo 650. And normally also now, 
when someone has a fever, they automatically go out and buy the Dolo 650. To think that someone has bribed my doctor to give me a particular medication, is that a fair assessment of this? Could you explain to us how something like, uh, you know, 1000 crore rupees worth of gifts for doctors, how does that work? Right, so, uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, you started with the term medical ethics and uh, obviously the term ethics actually conjures up a very sort of moral vision of, of uh, a certain way of uh, living, practicing, etc. But actually when you look at, uh, and I'll come to Dolo in a minute, but when you look at the practice of medicine, practice of healthcare, it's more about uh, the day-to-day the -day, uh, benefits uh, for a patient, uh, the trust in the relationship between mm -hmm. the doctor and patient. And, and in fact, uh, ethics is being more and more looked at also from the professionalism lens, which means yes. that this is a profession, this is not, this is not a trade. And mm. there is some very good reason historically why healthcare is a profession because it has a monopoly. Healthcare practitioners like me have a monopoly to practice medicine and in return society expects that we therefore, since they have given us this monopoly to practice, that we behave in a certain way, that we execute your, our responsibilities in a certain way. Uh, and that is really uh, to an extent what uh, ethics is about, it's partly about uh, also about professionalism uh, and, and this contract with society. Hmm. Now coming to Dolo, so first of all, you know, uh, this is there's nothing new uh, in the sense yeah. this is old story. Uh, for that matter, this is globally up an issue which is that doctors prescribe, there are hundreds of brands, how do doc doctors choose a brand and therefore there is a when there is a pharma industry and and the and a healthcare industry and doctors who prescribe, how does the pharma industry uh, ensure that their brand is prescribed by a doctor? And if you actually imagine this situation, it's quite easy to sort of understand that there will be methods used, some uh, legitimate, some scientific, but perhaps soon when there is competition, there will be an attempt to influence the doctor. The big question actually has been what is uh, a legitimate way of influencing a doctor and what crosses the boundary and, and many countries have grappled with this. In parts of the world, especially South Asia and India, where generally uh, regulation in healthcare is very low, uh, uh, these boundaries have not been defined. Uh, there is really no third party uh, which looks at this relationship and its boundaries. The state periodically has made noises about regulating this area, but really it has been left to the voluntary nature of healthcare on one hand mm -hmm. and doctors on one hand and the pharma industry on the other hand to evolve some kind of mechanism to not cross boundaries. But have we established as a country what we, you know, where that line is because it could be anything from and we've seen this, you go to your doctor, there's a little like notepad and there's a clock and something else, something else with a pharmaceutical brand. So obviously that's a gift on that table. Going right up to here is a trip to Europe for a conference completely free of cost, paid for by the pharma company. Now, Dolo is paracetamol and it's Again, a very easy over-the-counter sort of uh, drug, but that it could, right up till cancer treatment, everything. And I think one one thing our audience should understand is that one drug would be available at five different brands for five different price ranges. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, of course, Dolo is paracetamol, of commonly used. Perhaps in paracetamol, if you compare brands, you may not find very wide differences. Mm. But when you go to some of the uh, specialized drugs, including some of the injectable antibiotics, and I always have given this example, there is there are some antibiotics I use or people use in hospital practice, which are uh, strong but effective antibiotics. And there the difference of one dose can be to the extent of two and a half to three thousand. And there are typically three doses a day, and you often take it for eight days. So you can do the math and see that a brand, shifting a brand can save a person 
maybe 50,000 or 40,000 rupees. Now, in this debate, of course, as I said, first of all, uh, there is the patient interest. There is also an issue which is that often doctors say that, look, we do receive some form of gifting and support from the pharma companies, but we don't get influenced. Mm. But actually, the evidence up to now clearly shows that they do get influenced. There are people who have actually tracked prescription practices, looked at when medical associations have been given money and grants and shown upward swings in, in prescription, etc. So, this is not about uh, individual morality. Uh, this is about the fact that it works at a at a slightly subtle level when you have a when you have a in your clinic something staring at you a calendar with with a name uh, it it obviously is obviously subtly working on your prescription practice and therefore uh, there is a need for third party intervention now let's take the example of covid if you if you remember the phase where a lot of new new drugs new medicines were being pushed. Mm. You know, there was something very interesting happening and this is something you will identify with, uh, you know, which is that, you know, I remember particularly a, 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 a well-established television channel, National, interviewing two doctors who were principal investigators mm. in a study of a new drug, who were being interviewed by a very well-known anchor on the 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 efficacy of the drug now hmm. if there are two people who are investigating a drug who are obviously you know principal investigators for for drug studies are are paid by companies fair enough they they are putting in some effort now they are being interviewed and they are singing pains to the drug now this is unprecedented because yeah. this is like manufacturing consent you know you are on on television so I think there's a again a key area which has emerged globally, mm. which is this that if you are a doctor or a healthcare professional who is who is has some links with industry, fair enough. Tell us that you have that link. So mm. for example, if a television anchor is interviewing these two people, there could be something called dis disclosure, which says that these two are being funded Bio for research. doing this research and let the audience then decide whether their views are uh, objective or not, whether their views are likely to be neutral or not. And that is one area which globally is being pushed that if you are fund being receiving even indirect funding, please tell your audience that uh, you are receiving that funding. So, I want to come back to the idea that the same drug could be available at different prices from different brands and you said particularly if we talk about something that needs to be injected for example, it could be in one hospital stay 50,000 rupees of a difference. There's also, we notice a lot of times hospitals tell us to buy from the pharmacy. But when you go across the street and buy the same thing outside, you will get it for much cheaper. Is that a conflict of interest? Is that fair? Is that, uh, is that crossing an ethical line? Where, where do you stand on that? Yeah. Yeah, so look, uh, this is well-known practice and very clearly. And, you know, if, if any hospital is trying to suggest that you know, this practice is uh, sort of done for quality, etc. That's disingenuous. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, and hospitals, those who are transparent will admit it, that they make a lot of their income through the Pharmacy. margins of the drugs. A huge part of the hospital's income. So, it, so be it. But the fact of the matter is, as a consumer, as a patient, you're absolutely right. You go across and you find that the same medicine is cheaper. And therefore, you wonder as a consumer whether why is it that the hospital pushes you to buy a certain medicine only from the hospital? Mm -hmm. Now, let's let this brings me to another issue, which is that there is often a sort of uh, argument given that look, as a healthcare institution, as a hospital, we must look at quality. Uh, how can we allow people to go and buy medicines on their own because we sort of bet quality? But that's again, if you try to sort of break it down, that's that's quite disingenuous in the sense that. You see, a costlier drug is not necessarily a better quality drug. In fact, it may mm. not be. Mm. Uh, what has happened with the way drug, drug research has evolved is that the original molecules cost more because the company is allowed to charge more. And when the replicas are made by other companies, including very high quality Indian companies, they are allowed to charge less. Uh, and therefore, you will get drugs which are cheaper. So, cheap is not poor quality, 
costly is not better quality. Uh, on the other hand, you're already overwhelmed with bills. Yes. Uh, you are paying through your pocket most often. Uh, 80% of India pays out of pocket still. And on top of that, the institution is telling you, you must buy from inside the hospital at the end, etc. Et in so. fact, there's a very large hospital chain in Bangalore, and I know this from personal experience, where from OPD, the prescription goes directly through their system to the pharmacy. So as a patient, I've just seen you as a doctor. I don't have the prescription in hand. I have to go to the pharmacy and get the prescription as well as the medication from there. Is that unethical? Well, you know, so this is, so these are practices which if questioned by, by a, a third party, yes. will be certainly unfair trade practices. Ethics okay. is a, we will we'll come to the ethics, but I think this could be unfair trade practices. Mm. Monopolization, cartelization is unfair trade practice. So if, if Indian healthcare, uh, is trying to move towards modernity of a certain type, you know, global. Yes. Uh, they need to look at this. Can there be unfair trade practices? What is, what is uh, professional? Uh, mm. and therefore, monopolization, cartelization, opacity in the way you, you sort of uh, prescribe drugs, uh, not giving choices to patients, uh, certainly qualify for uh, bad practice. Is it common practice for doctors to be asked to increase the revenue of the hospitals they work? Right. So, uh, the short answer is yes. And uh, there's again, it's an open secret. These are open yeah. secrets of Indian healthcare. But you see, I don't think, this is my experience working across three, four, five institutions of varying size over the last 20 years, including, of course, I have worked in the public se sector simultaneously. So, I have a sort of schizophrenic kind of existence. but. So, I don't think that uh, every institution does it very overtly. I think what happens is that typically many doctors, many professionals uh, feel that say, they are sort of duty bound to sort of participate in the revenue model of the hospital. Mm. So, we've lost our sort of independence in that sense, autonomy in that sense, partly because doctors are paid significant amounts. Partly because if you start questioning the revenue model, uh, you could be sidelined. So there's a lot of discomfort. I mean, I talk to my colleagues, they are uncomfortable uh, about some of the, when they themselves see the bills, etc. But what has happened is that we've been co-opted into the system. We have no independent voice. You would, you would be interested to know that India's private sector is huge now. The doctor working in the hospital has no a union of theirs, so no mm. organization which can defend them. And therefore, if a doctor squeals... The Indian Medical Association? No, the Indian Medical Association really has no say in individual hospitals. Okay. And there have been examples of doctors who have tried to blow the whistle, brought out certain points, who have been summarily suspended uh, mm. uh, overnight. So there is also a certain fear. So, so let me just break this down. You're saying that the concept of a doctor owning a hospital is fundamentally something that doesn't happen in the rest of the world. It's a model that only happens in India. And it creates a system where that doctor is now incentivized to drum up revenue rather than purely focus on treatment. Yeah. So, so let's, let's just understand how healthcare has evolved in the rest of the world. So a large part of the world uh, has universal healthcare run by governments through yes. taxes. Yes. There's no question of a doctor owning a hospital. It's all government-led. Uh, another section of the world where there could be private institutions, often linked to universities, but the uh, funding is through uh, insurance companies. And insurance companies, for good or bad, try to control the way the hospital spends money, uh, how patients are charged, etc. India and South Asia also, but even in the South Asian scale, India is the country, the world, where the largest number of people pay out of pocket. Hmm. Now that is sought to be changed and I must say this that we are seeing a trend in the last few years where more and more insurance, both state funded insurance, government led insurance or individual insurances coming up but still it's largely out of pocket where individuals are paying and that's, that's a very peculiar system. Uh, doctors uh, owning hospitals, doctors investing huge amounts. So, it's a, I, I wrote about this many years back, the doctors as entrepreneurs, mm. uh, doctors owning chains of hospitals. Yes. 
it's it's right it's it's inherently a conflict of interest situation doctors should are scientists primarily hmm. primarily doctors are caregivers uh, if if they wanted to go into business and med, you know they they could have chosen a different path and they could they could dealing but the same person delivering care the same person owning the hospital the same person buying the drugs the same person deciding bills is is a daily conflict of interest and i think uh, therefore somewhere along the way uh, after independence uh, and that one is not able to locate the exact point but slowly but surely we moved to this model because you know we inherited healthcare from the british so so we uh, at at one stage uh, i thought that maybe we are slowly beginning to learn the lessons so i'll give an example of the city we are in mumbai right so if you remember in the peak of the covid wave mumbai had a structure yes. where if you needed a hospital and you were covid positive or you were having breathlessness and so you could call a number yes and they directed you right so there was a organized referral system organized by the municipal corporate which yes. actually means that that we have a capacity to do, to do so today one year down the line if you are out on the streets and if you let's say have a acute emergency you cannot call anyone you mm. can call an ambulance service but it will all be chaotic and disorderly yes you are left to the so if you are unconscious you can't even decide where you go if you are conscious maybe you will mumble something and say take me here take me there etc so we are back to square one so whether it is the organization of the healthcare system wherever it is the uh, the fee structures in private hospitals so again it was an unprecedented move yes that it was being monitored it was being controlled yeah. Yeah. so we are back to square one so so but you know and i want to put this argument because i know a lot of people have said this to me um the city of mumbai and i can vouch for it because i was here i was tracking on a daily basis they managed to get a handle on the problem to a point where to reasonable efficiency people who needed beds oxygen medication got access within say 6 hours of making that first phone call it was not the case in many other cities uh, and i know a lot of people who argue saying you know this european the the uk version of go through the system just takes forever whereas in india if you can afford it you get the best care world class care if you need it now in my opinion that's great but what happens to all the people who cannot afford the world class care but even with that system there are issues that we are not realizing aren't they yeah so i think one of the things that covid did was to expose that section of society which always got it their way yes uh, they also felt it right because you know it's very clear those who are and that that perhaps includes us also that people like us who have access connections contacts uh, and yes. of course money uh, you will never be refused a bed you will always get a bed so people got exposed to that so the analogy that you gave of a system which is organized and therefore it does what is called triage or triage sure. uh so it's a very important thing to understand that okay you may have to wait for a routine procedure but if you have an emergency the system will take care of you yes uh, immediately efficiently with good standards what you're proposing is that that covid system where if i have a issue i call an ambulance i call a number they send me an ambulance they or someone over the phone decides how urgent my problem is and the problem is dealt with that way everybody goes through the same system you don't bypass the system because you are famous or you have money or you have access so there's a there's a caveat there and it's a very important caveat see what has happened is that we have two parallel systems in india so for example mumbai has public hospitals and yes. private hospitals right so if you have an emergency logically you should be going to the nearest hospital mm. but what has happened is that because a large section of the population now desires to go to the private sector so they would want to go to the private hospital yeah but let's take the case of a acute emergency an accident yeah for the police for the ambulance person on the road they should have a system in place where they take them to the nearest, nearest hospital. hospital but then that assumes that the casualties of all hospitals are equally equipped to deliver care yes. or the police or the ambulance knows 
that these are the 10 hospitals. That's how all, all big cities of the world, uh, world work. And whenever I have traveled to any city of the world, any big city, especially in the, the developed world, this is one question I ask, what happens to emergencies? You know, about two months ago, I was in Buenos Aires said, this is what all of them say, that we have an ambulance service, we have 10 designated hospitals for trauma, for heart care, etc. So you will go to that hospital because the ambulance service will take you yes. to the nearest hospital. Now, if you later need something special or if you later want to seek private care, you can choose to go that pathway. Today, what happens here is that uh, uh, first of all, I mean, there's very tragic things that happen. It has happened in the past and now also can that if you do not have the, the, the money or the contacts, you may go from hospital to hospital. Mm. Where you are told there is no bed, there is no bed and you sort yeah, of... Or we don't have the equipment to solve your problem. Yeah, or there is some such thing. Yeah. So there is no accountability in, in this system. By the way, people don't realize this that in the US, which people often quote as an example of uh, private really? medicine, yeah. healthcare in the US is extremely tightly regulated. Mm. Extremely tightly. I mean, you have to just talk to doctors working in that system, they will tell you that Every act of theirs, every move of theirs is heavily regulated. Mm. What we've done is this. We have allowed a big private sector, sort of entrepreneurial spirit, so it grows. So it is good for the state because, you know, this, therefore the state does not have to deliver, the private sector is delivering, you know, sort of. But we allowed it in an unregulated fashion and now it has grown to a point where it sort of bites back. And then mm. periodically in a crisis, the state has to step in and say, wrap a knuckle and say, look, behave yourself. But when the crisis goes, uh, the animal is back to its own. So that's that's what happened. That's what happened in COVID. COVID. That they they had to control them, but uh, it will be back because their basic instinct yeah. is you know. I, because I remember when COVID first struck, the first wave in Mumbai, it hit us hardest in the beginning. At that point, we were talking about the fact that infectious diseases hospitals were built by the British, and after that, not at all. Yeah. Because. We don't put enough pressure on our public sector system to improve because the private sector is constantly throwing new investment yeah. at this at that this thing. Yeah. And that, that means also that, and we've we've heard about this, people getting turned away at the public sector, saying that we've done whatever we could. Agar aap chahiye to private mein leke jao. Yeah. And yeah. That's so, a conflict as well. Yeah. So private has become the buzzword for better treatment, and that's a, you know, that's. That's part perception, part, part reality. There's also an issue of overcrowding, poor hygiene in public hospitals, and long waiting lines, etc. But that's, that's the problem that you to create two unequal systems, uh, obviously unequal, and then you set them against each other. It's, yes. it's, it's not going to work. Yeah. Either you amalgamate the two by some leap of imagination, strong political power, or you strengthen your public sector to the point where ordinary or middle class citizens feel that this is this is my hospital this i will is, go yeah. there and get i have paid taxes let me get care here and uh, you know get me get decent care i may not get posh care but i will get good care adequate care yeah, yeah i think that's where we have sort of lost the battle partly you know of reality partly perception and but i think you know there's one more point that you see somewhere along the line the people who matter at that also includes us again, uh, have sort of stopped being patients or who stopped seeking the services of public institutions. Hmm. And therefore, uh, the ability of the person who seeks care there to yes. push back yes. is not there. Yes. Uh, so it's almost as if there's a big favor being done to those people hmm. by, by the state, etc. So they will not push back. When the pushback comes, unfortunately, it comes in very bizarre forms so violence against doctors. Yes, you know, assault. Because they, assault because they go to a casualty and see that some something is not working. Some doctor is struggling with an instrument which is not working. Now what does a person do? Of course, I'm not trying to uh, sort of defend violence. Uh, I'm just saying that look at that scenario. Somebody is dead and on top of that somebody goes and says, what happened? And they say, nikal jao ya se or hmm. some such rude behavior. And the person just snaps. Yeah. So I think this uh, this is something we. But again, you know, where where at which point in our history did we do this? At which point did we say, look, we will create these two parallel systems and happily sort of create a system for us ourselves? And uh, but as far as something very interesting. So we want all our 
doctors to be educated in the public health system. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at the uh, today the uh, merit list okay, of students, they will all want to be educated in public institutions. In Mumbai, for example, they talk KEM, etc. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but 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 why, may not want that? to work there. Is that and, and I've I've spent a lot of time with the doctors, the resident doctors association. It's interesting. Is it because uh, getting a medical and medical seats is this whole other thing, right? Getting a seat in the public sector is a more affordable. Um, it's more expensive to study in a private medical college, if I'm not mistaken. Also, there's just more hands-on experience. Does that so? Why is it that people who are studying to be doctors want to be in the public sector? They want to be in KEM. They want to be in JJ. They want to be in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi. But when they work, they want to be in the private sector. Right. So that's a very complex question, but I will attempt to answer it. So clearly, uh, you know, if you look at the private medical colleges in India, with exceptions, of course, but clearly their focus is very different. Uh, their focus has really never been uh, delivering good education, right? If you look at the history of private medical college, who set them up, why did they set them up, uh, what sort of teachers they got, etc. That is not to say that they can't train people. So that's point number one. The quality of training and teaching in public institutions clearly is, if there is a parameter called better in terms of seriousness of it, it would be better than the private private medical colleges. Mm. The second issue is of course volumes, and you're right that volumes matter. And yes, I think there's an uncomfortable truth out there, which is that in the government hospital, if you are if you are being trained in surgery, as a trainee, you will be operating mm. because there is the ordinary person, so you will operate more. Uh, that's 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 not to I mean that's an uncomfortable truth, yeah. But you see a much wider variety of cases, mm. and therefore you will get better training. Now, the question therefore is why is it that therefore people don't continue to work there? And by the way, I, whenever I talk about this subject, I must put this out here that uh, I worked for almost 12 years in KEM after my post-graduation and I left. I, I immediately of course joined the public hospital as a part-time doctor. Uh, so for me to sort of pontificate on all this is <laughs> somewhat uncomfortable, maybe even partly a uh, little uh, hypocritical, but you see uh, the fact of the matter is that people today, why are they entering medicine? I think we must look, go, go back to that. Most people are entering medicine as a means to upward mobility. Hmm. This, this is a profession where you can make a lot of money? Uh, this is a profession in. where you can, you are guaranteed income. Yes. Uh, there is no unemployment. Yes. Any doctor who says that, you know, people, it's, it's all uh, rubbish, you know, people, yeah. is, is, you, you're guaranteed a certain income. I think the good part about this profession even today is that even if you do average work averagely well and you serve people decently, mm -hmm. uh, you have people who will come to you with health problems and you will earn an income. So effectively, we have aped the American system where we've allowed private sector the entrepreneurial opportunities to create their own hospitals, whether it's the pharmaceutical companies or the doctors themselves, but we haven't done any of the regulation. That's right, absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head and that's what we need to understand that even for a private system to deliver, uh, let's one is of course towards public care, but also quality care, mm. you need regulation. Because of the full, it's, it's otherwise full of these incentivization, corrupt practices, um, conflicts of interest. And healthcare clearly, I mean, look at the health parameters of any country, and you will see a clear link between two things. Uh, one, on one hand, is the system publicly funded? How much is the investment of the government yes. in the healthcare system? And number two, how well it is regulated for the needs of its people. And even amongst, uh, amongst the developed world, those who have tried to do it better, more focus. And for that matter, even South Asia, Sri Lanka, 
Yes. Now, currently, Sri Lanka is in a different crisis, but Sri Lanka's healthcare system for many years delivered much better because clearly they adopted much more of the NHS model hmm. and implemented it. We know now that Bangladesh is creeping up in terms of some of its uh, healthcare parameters. And the reason is not because some individuals have suddenly overnight turned good and it's because there is a thought process. I, I think it's very interesting, you know, in India we associate and you said this as well, better service and better processes with the private sector. And we associate our public sector with weak systems. So for example, healthcare, we say, you know, a government hospital is considered like a poor place to get your uh, uh, education. A government school is not considered as well as. And then that sort of flows into your insurance companies and your airlines and everything. But the, for me, the keen understanding of the fact that public sector is meant to serve the public, that's why it is created. Private sector is only meant to create revenue for its investors. That is its only loyalty. There is nobody in the private sector who is a saint who is there to do you any favors. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I, to be honest, it's, it's, we shouldn't even expect them to do. You shouldn't expect. Yeah, them. yeah. yeah. But look, the, that, that's the problem. That what, what we've done over the years, all of us, uh, uh, sort of partly party to that, mm. is that you are absolutely right. Public hospitals. On one hand, we sort of glorify them as centers of, uh, you know, great learning, etc., which they are. Hmm. But on the other hand, for the day-to-day -day experience for the patient, we have made it terrible. Yes. There's a reality there. Yes. And when I was working and, uh, you know, in, in a, uh, one of the big uh, peripheral hospitals of the corporation, uh, so very often I would come across patients who would, who in our department, where we would sort of, talk to them and sometimes some of them had complaints about issues in the ward and some of us would go and try to sort out these complaints and the the staff would tell them that look you are in a government hospital don't expect yeah. uh, a fan once one, somebody told me that why are you expecting a fan this is a government hospital why are you expecting comfort why are you expecting a room so you know we have equated public because you are getting it for free so yeah, so there is a there is a ideology at work which is very unfortunate, which is that because this is a public hospital, you will get poor hygiene, filth, uh, your fans may not work, you, people will treat you rudely, you will get appointments for investigations, so three investigations to be done, three separate days. Yeah. So there's, so I think there's, again, if one wants to look at it sociologically, I think it's a clear reflection of uh, of our biases, you know, uh, our biases towards what we see as public services for the yes. sort of public. And that's where some of the new experiments, you know, if they work, some states, etc., where they're trying to even amalgamate or even borrow some of the practices mm. of, of what may be termed private sector practices. But for example, MCGM tried to set up evening OPDs. Now, what is the logic? The logic is that even the ordinary working class person cannot take leave in the morning yes. and attend a OPD. So the working class person actually thinks that in the private sector, I can finish my day, day, go in the late evening, my doctor will see me and treat me. I will save the pay that I will otherwise lose because if I'm going to. Yeah. So actually there's also economics so, at work. Since, you know, I would ask you this, um, even with all of the private sector intervention at this point, when one has an appointment with a doctor, almost any doctor, it still almost always involves a wait. Sometimes an hour, sometimes more than an hour. And like you said, in the public sector, it will be even longer. But your average doctor will still keep you waiting with an appointment for at least an hour and a half. Is there no way to make that system more efficient? Right. So this is again uncomfortable territory. <laughs> but let me begin by saying that, you know, I have often been told by people, that look, that doctor, you know, uh, you have to wait for three hours, so he must be very busy, he must be very good. Must be very good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, please remember that there is a narrative like that. Having said that, yes, I think it is something to do with the professionalization of how we practice. It's also something to do with how we can be sort of paternalistic to our patients. So, patients yes. will wait. You yes. know, I am the doctor, I am yes. sort of, so patients will wait. I think this is beginning to change very slowly. But if if at all it is going to change, it is by reducing the gap between 
the pedestal of the doctor and, yes. and the person, uh, wherein, uh, you know, whilst you need to put faith and trust in a doctor, but you also need a certain modicum of uh, respect from the doctor in terms of your time, yes. uh, your, your necessity to know what that person is doing, answering your questions, etc. Very difficult to legislate on that, but I think it's about the social gap. And I think, you know, just to give, make this clearer, so you will see some states of India uh, where healthcare is better developed, and I'm saying this objectively, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, etc. But if you look at one of the reasons, there is pushback from the average citizens. Mm. So a more literate citizenry, a citizenry yes. which is more aware of their rights, will push back on healthcare, will push healthcare workers also to uh, respond better. In, in, in all these aspects. So, I think we, and you, you're absolutely right that, you know, uh, we, we do take lots of things for granted, you know, time, uh, appointment time. But I'm, I'm again going back, I think there is a narrative that, you know, somebody once, actually I heard a lecture by a very senior doctor who said that, look, in your, in your clinic, uh, don't ever see a patient on time, because that will mean that you're not very you busy. You have nothing else to do. So, please ensure that you see a patient late. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not still sure whether he was joking or whether he was serious, but you know, he certainly got very, uh, a lot of attention and interest for his, for his talk. So I think this is, uh, this is what it is partly. You know, and this brings me to, and I wanted to talk about this. You've called it information asymmetry, which is like a complicated term, but for the audience, it basically means that when I go to a doctor, the doctor knows so much and I know close to nothing. Right? Um, about what you're prescribing, why you're prescribing it. Now, you can be an annoying patient and keep asking, but why, but why, but why, but why, but why? But not all doctors will have the time or the inclination to answer all of those questions. Do you advise as a patient that I spend time on Google sort of understanding what I'm going through a little better because now there's a lot of information. A lot of doctors say don't Google because you're doing more damage than good. But how do I reduce the gap yeah. between what you know and what I don't know. Right. So first of all, I'm not one of those doctors who say don't Google. Okay. And don't, I don't make fun out of Google saying Dr. Google and all that. It's yeah. a very common yeah. sort of thing, Dr. Google and stuff like that. The fact of the matter is I use Google for many other things in my life. So I absolutely see the point in patients using Google. Okay. The issue, of course, is which side you use, what is the authenticity of the information, but there are plenty of high quality sites. WebMD, is that any good? Um, <laughs> it could be WebMD, there is something called UpToDate, which are, which are sites run by organizations which have actually looked at the quality of the information. Right. Yeah. But you know, again, I think what happens is that for, for a large number of doctors, you know, a patient who is, starts asking questions is a surprise. A patient who is sort of looked at Google and asked the right questions is even more worrying. Is even more worrying because you know my monopoly on information is yes. slowly reducing. Right. So actually, it's insecurity because if I am a surgeon and I want to advise surgery to a patient, but there are other three methods, and if the patient says or the person says, "Look, but why are you not suggesting me that other method?" It is reducing my monopoly on mm -hmm. on the knowledge system. And I think it is a threat and that's what I think doctors don't like. So when they make uh, sort of say Dr. Google or you know that Google patient etc. I think it's very paternalistic and I must finally tell you this. Most doctors when they become patients and this many of my colleagues have told me this. I have experienced it once where we are full of doubts, questions and when you read up uh, on that subject and you go to the doctor, you're much better informed. Yes, you feel a little, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, it's a, it's a very natural phenomenon. And I actually think that the more this happens uh, in an orderly way, the more accountable our healthcare system will be. In fact, historically, if in fact, now on, mm -hmm. uh, forgive me, now on the internet, in, you can Google and look up the medication that your doctor has prescribed. You can look up the side effects. You can look up alternatives. You, you, you must look up. You must because, because in India, unfortunately, uh, in the average interaction between the doctor and the patient, we do not talk about side effects. Mm. So actually, I suggest to patients now, the last few years, that look, this is what it is and here is a site 
and please look up the side effects by the way there's something called drug interactions people are on yes. multiple medications yes you know it's very common now so the drugs interact with each other i think clearly if if there is any country which needs access for its people to information it is india because there are many parts of india where uh, there is no doctor who is willing to uh, discuss this mm. uh, there is no doctor or if there is a doctor that doctor is actually may not have the knowledge so actually we are absolute, and people are by the way moving towards this and i would say some great experiments being done where uh, people are being armed with knowledge about common diseases where paramedics are being trained uh, uh people who have been taken from villages have been trained with yeah. to, to treat common diseases through the web through phones and etc so i think it's a it's a need you know that brings me to my next question that i wanted to address with you they there is a an attempt to sort of mainstream alternate medicine in india uh ayurveda homeopathy all of these other things and i'll come to that in a second but you've been fairly vocal during covid also about companies that were launching ayurvedic cures uh they've been pulled up patanjali is one of them uh, launched something during covid there were a lot of questions about whether or not the research was done and they're constantly making claims in the newspapers about we can treat blood pressure we can treat diabetes you know far better than yeah uh, you know mess yeah. western yeah, medicine yeah yeah we we can treat everything but when we have a disease we go to the modern doctor that's a different question yeah but i have had senior uh ayurvedic and homeopathic uh, doctor and i have get respect for them come and seek treatment with us so look i think it's very clear uh, first of all i i i don't know that science but having said that any science which exaggerates its claims mm. that it would also include modern medicine but which exaggerates its claims mm. says that we are this no all science uh, says that we can cure cancer we can cure this that and on top of that then starts advertising yes and on top of that not just advertises but starts running down the other system yes yeah uh that is something we have to uh, that is very dubious uh clearly there are, there are two types of ayush yeah the one is the ayush of let's say our grandparent generation where somebody somewhere would give you some medicine say this is good for you mm. you have a cough tulsi etc yes but now there is the new form of ayush which is the entrepreneurial industry ayush and patanjali is the, the best example it's a multi crore company which is one of the you can say the biggest of indian mm-hmm. pharma in that sense which is on a rampage because every opportunity for them is profit and therefore uh, the baba merrily goes on television and says things like i i cure covid you don't need oxygen and all sorts of claims uh, and he gets away with it Uh, he is playing to an audience so he has developed an audience yes. and that is dangerous dangerous and that is being driven by not the principles of ayush which is actually holistic low cost friendly uh, but but by the principles of money and therefore it is just another form of what we were discussing some time back which is pharma driving uh, perverse incentives uh, so people's faith in alternative systems of medicine is a reality mm. and it has something to do with the excesses of modern medicine there's no question mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah look there is this trope that because uh, you're saying the modern the the private sector has been so corrupt people are now turning to so i i, I would put it this way that I, i'm not sort of necessarily saying the private sector i'm saying that modern medicine has tended to work in silos mm. has not really been holistic uh has tended to over specialize super specialize and ignore the patient as a whole yes also has stopped empathizing at one point whereas the traditional systems some of the practitioners homeopaths i mean to me i don't know anything about homeopathy but the fact that the person sits with you for half an hour and talks to you yes itself me- brings you closer to the doctor or mm. but what is the solution then um is it to s- make sure that all possible pharmaceutical companies including ayurveda naturopathy and mainstream modern medicine follow certain rules of what they claim what their research does yes yes of course and you know i can give you an immediate example so you know uh, there is now a lot of work that has come out on let's say so there was uh, this compound called giloy which was commonly used during uh, covid 
as an immune booster. Mm. And a uh, lot of uh, practitioners of modern medicine started noticing, you know, especially those who work in liver disease, started noticing side effects, uh, which they could not explain. And people started coming in with, uh, with liver failure. Mm. And then they realized many of these patients were on Giloy. And then they did studies, etc., including biopsies to show that uh, Giloy in a subset of patients causes great harm to the liver. And the same thing has been looked at from the viewpoint of heavy metals, etc. So clearly, it's a misconception that alternative systems, medicine, drugs or IUSH drugs do not have side effects or mm. have very minimal side effects. They have side effects. So therefore, it's a good IUSH practitioner would say and some of them do say that you subject us to the same parameters yes. as you subject any drug. Uh, by the way, we must also acknowledge that uh, we have got drugs from Ayush. So, you know, for example, many people may not know this, but the new most effective drug today against malaria, which is the Artemetha group of compounds, has come to us from China, from the traditional Chinese system of medicine. The, the lady won a Nobel for that. Yes. So, they looked at it, they, they identified it, worked on it, did good quality studies and uh, you had that. So. Uh, whether it is herbs, plants, barks of trees, there is, there is a wealth of uh, medicines there, value there. But if we claim to be a modern nation with modern scientific parameters, let us subject everybody to the same parameters. So that brings us to the parameters that we are already subjecting everybody to and I understand that they are not very high. Because we have had recently the instance of Indian made cough syrup, which caused deaths of babies in Gambia. Yeah. Uh, a similar incident happened in Indonesia, although we don't know which cough syrups Indonesia was using, they haven't told us yet. But immediately after that happened, I remember I had a conversation uh, with Mudli Neelkanton who said that this has happened in India several times. Uh, the process with which we manufacture drugs, cough syrup, tablets in India is not regulated. Right. So Even for big companies. So whether it is Ayurveda, whether it is homeopathy, whether it is you know modern medicine, at the end of the day, the process with which this has been manufactured is not regulated for anybody. Right. So I think it would be a little uh, inaccurate to so say that it's not regulated. The regulations are there in place, mm. uh, our FDAs, etc. But I think what has happened, and uh, you know, talking of Gambia and the cough syrup, I must sort of take you back to uh, JJ Hospital in the 19, uh, 1980s. Exactly the same compound, glycerol. Okay. Exactly the same compound. I wrote about this actually that yes. there were deaths and you know that time Justice Lentin Commission etc. which looked into it. So clearly uh, drug regulation is an area which needs high level of integrity which is often missing and the reason is clearly and this, here is where corruption comes in. Uh, you know, we wrote the book and uh, people told us that you know so one of the responses they said that why are you talking of corruption only in healthcare and medicine? India is a corrupt country. But hold, wait, wait. Whilst, uh, whilst there is corruption everywhere, healthcare corruption is very dangerous. And this is another example, you know, Gambia and JJ, that corruption in healthcare could cost you your life. Mm. It's like corruption in, let's say, uh, people who make planes, um, appointing pilots. You know, if if you have if you have a crash, you die. So I think healthcare corruption is, is very dangerous. Uh, again, one is not being idealistic to say that you can root out every bit of corruption, but clearly our drug regulatory mechanisms are such that they are porous and open to corruption. And again, there I must link it to one more thing. And this is where again, I think globally, other countries are different mm. in the sense that there is corruption. It's a global phenomenon in healthcare also, but the crackdown, Yes. but the levels of punishment where where they don't particular i mean the us I, i'm no fan of the american health system is is really uh, in shambles but they have the capacity to punish people at the top also and we 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 are we are challenged on that uh, because somebody is connected somebody is powerful somebody is from a certain family whatever they will get away so clearly, Nobody has really been punished in India for a spurious drug for deaths caused by spurious drugs, according to what I have understood. So, so, so the Lenten Commission report gave names hmm. uh, of the manufacturers, of the FDA officials. So I must say this that because of journalists, and this I say to you as a, as a, one of the 
journalists I know. So, you know, the, the JJ case was completely ch chased by a group of reporters from the, from the Maharashtra Times and uh, the health minister had to resign. Hmm. I think the problem is that when we have a scandal, uh, people rise up, journalists rise up, the media rises up, some action is taken. But once public Things memory is short, and uh, so therefore we have no way to fence off <coughs> uh, areas which should have zero, to zero corruption, you know, zero tolerance for corruption by putting in structures. Yes. Uh, whether it is digitalization as one means, whether it is transparency, of course RTI is, is, is a great tool, but it's too many powerful vested interests. Uh, so I think that's some of the spurious drugs, some of the scandals we have seen is clearly corruption. And if we don't know what's happening to the Gurugram based uh, company which manufactured the cough syrup for Gam Gambia. But if somebody is taking a deep dive, somewhere along the way people have been probably paid mm. off, mm. etc. So whilst spurious drugs is a problem globally, I think our ability to crack down, punish, punish in an exemplary manner uh, and make an example is limited. Mm. Uh, for that matter, let me put it this way, uh, we, we actually seem to have developed a certain sort of ability to sort of distance the corruption uh, of certain sectors uh, from its sort of growth. So if that sector is growing, massively yes. you say it's okay you know some amount of corruption mm -hmm. but it's growing you know kind of thing till it reaches a point and in healthcare it does where it bites you and that's what is also happening to the hospital industry you know there was also this uh, this very curious incident that took place in Uttar Pradesh where someone was given musambi juice instead of platelets and that patient died now nobody went to jail that we know of yet even though somebody died. Is that fundamentally our problem? I mean, you know overseas they have malpractice lawsuits, they have uh, negligence, they have all of these things. In India we don't really. Is there a gap there that there's no accountability when, for when someone makes a mistake? This is not even an honest human mistake, right? Yeah. Every job have mistakes. Yeah, so clearly, so I think you're bringing up an important point, which is that, so there is uh, something called negligence, there is something called side effects, there is something called compensation for a patient. So coming to your example of uh, the platelets, now I don't know if it was Mosambi juice, but let me sh share this with you, that even a platelet transfusion given in the best of hospitals can have terrible reactions. Okay. Okay, so first of all, is it really indicated? If so, where the precautions taken, etc, etc. But the point I'm making is this, that it could be completely spurious platelets could be. It could even be that they developed a reaction which, these, which the facility could not handle. Mm. Having said all this, on one hand we need an investigation but on the other hand we also need a mechanism to compensate people who suffer because of this. Yes. You know, I've always wanted to ask why whenever there is a crisis in some other part, some remote part of the world that we don't normally even consider, there will be Indian medical students there to be rescued. It happened, I remember, when COVID broke out in China. There were Indian medical students there that needed to be rescued. Ukraine, we found Indian medical students there. Why is it that people are going to random parts of the world to study medicine? Do we, we obviously don't have enough seats. Um, there's a lot of, there's very heavy competition. There's also the question of Reservation, now we have EWS reservation as well. Explain to us the medical education system right now. Why right. is it so stressed out? Right. So, I think the first thing to say here is this, that uh, medicine as a, uh, as a stream is in extremely in demand and that demand is growing. Mm. And there's a reason for this. The reason is that uh, being a doctor in India, ensures or assures a student of, of course, as I said, a fixed income, but social upward mobility. Yes. Incidentally, uh, it also ensures your, it increases your value in the ma marriage market. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's a part of the social mobility. Uh, no, no, I mean, uh, in, in many states, 
uh, people invest in their in their medical education and I have talked to some people who said look, look at you and say look it, I'm going to get it back in dowry so you know when I get a postgraduate degree and so on and so forth but it's social mobility and we must recognize that now uh, therefore uh, parents want their kids uh, to be doctors now what are the options one is obviously you have the government medical colleges you have this huge denominator and a small numerator so yes. not limited number of seats yes. so intense competition and it is sort of uh, you know it's you know it brings goose pimples when i remember the sort of the the pathological competition i mean if iit quota is is one you know quota as in kota quota yeah. but here is another example of people sort of maybe from 8 9 standard for the 13th standard starting to study for medical entrance exams etc. But what happened is that the private medical colleges which emerged as an alternative to government colleges. Yes. Right. Why did government colleges not grow? Policies which said that you need this, you need mm. that. Some of them uh, were important. Some of them, some of it was also probably related to top down policies from the center etc. So there was a private medical education industry. The private medical colleges uh, were a law unto themselves or still are a law unto themselves. Some of them are what are called as autonomous yes. medical college, which means that Actually I sort no of problem. sit with you and say, okay, you want your kid. So, okay, so this is uh, 40 lakhs per year uh, or sort of 80 lakhs per year. And then you talk about things like, okay, I'll give you a concession of 10 lakhs. You know, that's yeah. how it goes. So actually, medical education in Ukraine, China, Russia is cheaper if you calculate it over the five years. So that's the first thing to understand. But this is one of the very interesting things because I've had students who have passed out from Russia, Ukraine, China who worked with us and actually found that they are reasonably well trained. Okay. Now, I won't go into why that is the case. Maybe that's, it's the structure there. So they're very reasonably well trained. Now, if you're getting reasonably good training and it is going to save you money and you can come back to the system. Now, that's there's another issue there, which is they have to give an exam. Mm. It's a pretty tough exam. Why not? Yeah. Uh, and that's what is happening. I mean, who would want to go to, you know, minus 20 degrees temperature, you know, in some far flung area of yeah. Russia, you know, you have to learn Russian, yeah. etc. When you can do it in Thani if you are a Mumbai student. Yes. So obviously there is that reason that actually saving people money and uh, also getting decent. There's one more small thing which I discovered when I dug deep into this. If you are, if you are educated in some of these countries, you have a slightly easier pathway to later go to Europe, etc. Mm. So that could be, could another be another reason. potential, potential yes. reason. I know that you have strong views on the matter and I, I must ask you about this. Does reservation in healthcare training and medical colleges improve representation which is what it was meant to do or does it hurt merit right so you know again we need to uh, step back and uh, try and look at the concept of merit so I, I know there's one way I have done it in my writing which is this look I'll tell you about my batch okay GS medical college batch of around 160 so let's say there were around uh, maybe roughly about 40 at that time, at that time the, the numbers were small uh, of students who came in through a uh, reserved category. Many of them good friends of mine and we, uh, we all worked together with, and then we had students who, who came in through the sort of, you know, merit, some of them from very sort of, you know, at my time there was this strange thing about South Mumbai versus the rest yes. of Mumbai and still, still there is that tension. So now many of them did exceedingly well in, mm. uh, in medicine, but today they are in the US and Europe. So on the other end, on the other end, and there I have data for this. Okay. Those from the reserved sections with very few exceptions are working here. Many of them are working with in their corporation own in their own environment. Yes. So what is more relevant to us? What is more relevant to our people? So I think the metrics of what is merit is the first thing I need to define. If yes. merit is a, a sort of degrees, that's one. If merit is sort of a, a vacuous sense of, uh, you know, bubble, somebody bubbling with knowledge, but not able to connect to people around and delivering the care that they need, 
that's not a model that's not a merit that we want in healthcare a lot of people who grew up in the cities probably don't understand the disparity or the difference between access to healthcare and hospitals in a big city and maybe 100 kilometers outside of that big city so a lot of rural india for example has to travel a great deal for for treatment which is where this representation through reservation becomes important because if someone can go back and serve the tribal community serve the disenfranchised community that according to you is far more valuable so i think that's that's one of the mechanisms one is again not trying to suggest that uh, the by reservation we are ensuring uh, delivery of services to those who uh, to the underserved areas but yes it's one of the mechanism that the higher the pers- the the stronger is the root of the person in a in a village or in a rural area probably the more likely that person having said that of course once one comes to a city uh, very often uh, the person is tempted to be sucked into the to the urban landscape and urban landscapes as many people have said which is true is are in a way in a way liberating but i'm just saying therefore that uh, coming back to the question on reservation the the problem with the argument of merit is this that you need to yes. decide what is the metric of merit and it's whose whose perspective you are looking at it from if you are looking at the from, from the perspective the common indian in the hinterlands or those outside the big cities or for that matter even in let's say big cities those in the slums of the cities their perspective would be give us doctors give us healthcare which serves us mm. let the part the actors in that healthcare system be accessible to us and if there are mechanisms you can do that please do them yes uh and therefore in that context i say that forms of affirmative action forms of pushing people towards going to underserved areas either by semi coercive means or by incentivization uh is what we need like the bond which tells um several of the medical professionals who studied in government institutions that they have to serve rural india for a certain number of years yes so there is a bond and the bond is very interesting so the bond it's it's i think a, a extremely uh, logical concept which is that i am investing in your education society mm-hmm. so therefore you please pay back and yes. you you don't want to pay back throughout your career fair enough it is your choice but pay back for 2 years yeah whether that means that we are changing the face of healthcare in underserved areas that's a separate discussion maybe not just by a two year bond yes. but it's a payback system yes. but one can be even more imaginative about it uh and that imagination can be in two directions one is one can continue to do it throughout a doctor's career mm. uh so for example if you say that doctors who train in indian healthcare okay to a particular point for periods of time in their professional growth will work in underserved areas maybe their area of specialization but they will work in underserved areas that could be one way of doing mm-hmm. it which is uh, which is again payback but over a prolonged period of time uh there could be other imaginative ways of doing it and one of the things that many countries have done and which is being explored in india but i am not so sure whether uh, it has worked out well is that you actually create courses mm. which are limited knowledge limited training which where the practitioners would be recognized to work in underserved areas yes. so there was something called a bridge course there was yes. something called uh, a short term course now that caused a uproar uh, amongst uh, my fraternity including mm. the indian medical association which say that you know you are creating quacks and all it it really is again vacuous i think clearly 80% of health needs are uh, can be delivered with limited training uh, and this has been shown time and again paramedics nursing practitioners limited courses can deliver so clearly uh, the point one is making is that one can be more creative about this imaginative about this and in this whole uh, focus on delivering care where does merit fit in of a student is what we need to actually mm. dissect if i may ask you doc why did you choose medical sciences and choose a profession what made you become a doctor 
right? I was sort of worried about this question, <laughs> but uh, no, in the sense that look, uh, when you are a 15 year old or 16 year old in India, the India of the 80s, you know, uh, you know that that there are you you are, you know you had to be an engineer or a doctor in a middle class you know middle class uh, predominantly Maharashtra my mother's Maharashtrian so Maharashtrian family it was a good thing to do uh, incidentally both my parents uh, my father passed away they were doctors but you know that time uh, it was clear that you know uh, doctor or engineer you know that was the thing that was a formula so I do not want to sort of ascribe uh, some great depth to my decision of becoming a doctor at the age of 16 or 15 yeah Having said that, if somebody asks me today, and I do occasionally get mm. these parents who say that, you know, what do you think, should my son or daughter take a medicine? And I say, absolutely. Uh, I only say two, three things. I said, first, why is that your son or your daughter taking a medicine? Uh, if it's for science, it's a great idea. It's, it's huge science, huge science, developing science. It's a great science to be in. Yeah. Also, is it about the satisfaction of being with people, serving people? Great. But is it about quick money, uh, that upward mobility? Well, good. It's, a, it's an aspiration for everybody. But then we, you need to remember that this is an 8-10 year course. Mm. You need to remember the competitiveness, the hard work, etc. And the so, general tolerance for blood and bodily fluids and, you know, well, bad the, hours. The general <laughs> tolerance for blood, you know, in, in the first week of medicine, in my time, and it's still the same, you are taken to the dissection hall in anatomy. And you see uh, dead bodies which are preserved, right? And it's quite horrible. Uh, the smell is horrible, the look and the bodies are opened, etc. Now, I don't know what it is now, but in my time, every year, every batch, about two or three students would faint on the first day and some of them would leave okay. because they just found the whole thing so revolting. Uh, Which so is interesting because they've studied from the fifth standard to take the entrance and then they took the entrance and well, then they got into the college. Nothing, <laughs> has, nothing has prepared them for the real life of uh, dealing with patients, death, death, uh, death in front of your eyes, uh, pain, the piercing cries of, uh, of individuals. You know, those who studied medicine in GS Medical KM in my time, ward number four, ground floor, Aruna Shangbak, yes. would cry out every day. Uh, piercing cries which would sort of throughout the hospital. When she was moved by the nurses, when she was bathed, she would probably get intense pain. You know, it's a vegetative state, yes, but they still have. So, you have to then, so we would ask questions, who is she, what is this going on, etc. So, you know, you have to come to terms with immense suffering. And that's what very often they are not prepared for. I'm not trying to suggest that, so many people do then engage, do, do develop the sort of ability, skills. In fact, sometimes uh, the, the problem is that with time you may even get numb to it, mm. which means it, it numbs and it sort of, it is glorified that you should be dispassionate. That's another tricky part. Whilst you need to uh, be logical in your thinking, but let's say if you're too dispassionate about your patient's problems, then you also distance yourself from things like, why should my patient pay more? So you say, you know, that's not my territory. You know, if the hospital is uh, yeah. charging more, okay, you know, that's the problem between the patient and the hospital. Some of my colleagues actually have said this to me. Why are you getting into this? Uh, that's between the patient and the hospital. You know, my job is to operate and go. But you know, the thing is this, that clearly, I, and I say this uh, with a sense of, uh, you know, responsibility partly, but a sense of regret that clearly actually as doctors working in this current, uh, you know, in the belly of the beast of Indian healthcare, there is an opportunity, even though there may be small fights, there's an opportunity to actually make changes. And there are doctors who have done that mm. by uh, whistleblowing, by pushing people, uh, by uh, taking, take, going to courts. A uh, lot of change in Indian healthcare has come through pushbacks, either by patients. It's a very interesting thing that patients and families pushing back through patient rights groups, uh, 
doctors pushing back, doctors filing cases, etc. So it's a huge opportunity because uh, you can make an impact yes. on the large number of lives with some knowledge that we have gained by working in healthcare, uh, giving it to people and saying, look, this is how it can be better. This is how we can improve access. Uh, P.K. Sethi's work in the Jaipur Fort, for example, it's a phenomenal work because what did he do as an orthopedic surgeon? He said, look, our people cannot walk after an amputation. They cannot afford the costly prosthesis that come from abroad. So let me make a prosthesis. Let me make it through locally available. And he made a process. People walked after his, uh, you know. So I think there is also a lot of scope for innovation hmm. in Indian healthcare. And this is an area which is very exciting for young people. Innovation, by the way, you know, whilst technology by itself is, uh, is uh, you know, sometimes over exaggerated, the value of technology. But the fact is that we are moving slowly, whether we like it or not, towards areas like, you know, I say this slowly because it sounds a little bit of a jump from what I've been talking the last one hour but areas like artificial intelligence. And I must tell you this, that I have been engaging on this area a little bit now uh, because I have been sort of pulled into some activities where, you know, actually it has immense potential to improve access mm -hmm. because it can use the smartphone. What you said, accessing yes. information, yes. easy way to access information. So you have a symptom, you put it into your smartphone and it tells you one, two, three, because there are neural networks which connect you, etc. And it can refer me depending on the It can refer you, it the... can tell you when to do something. So, so you believe that fundamental triaging can be moved to AI? Uh, with, with time, with time. With time. Uh, if triaging is made, is, is taken away from doctors, uh, put into the system, uh, which is kind of automated, and which says, okay, if this is how it is going, you need to triage this way. But of course, it cannot stop at triaging. I think the problem with any technology and including AI is this. Can AI make an impact on healthcare policy? Mm. So if you triage, if you, you know, I'm, we, whether we, we've participated in, in, in Bandra Baba Hospital, I worked for many years. So we participated in a global trial on triaging in trauma victims. And there's a lot of data that is coming out of simple triage systems. But after you triage and the triage tells you that this patient needs to go into hospital or ICU or needs to be operated for a head injury. If your system does not have the ability mm. to deliver that care, then mm. what then will then triage do? So, but having said this, yes, access to information in areas uh, through devices and the, the use of the smartphone or even teleconsultations. Mm. I think it has immense potential, teleconsultation to far-flung areas. So my last question to you, and I should have asked this earlier, there, there have been some instances of young people who have, who, of reasonable fitness, who've had sudden heart attacks. And there's a rumor sort of doing the round saying this, it could be an adverse reaction to maybe the COVID vaccine or something that was given during COVID. Is there any sort of basis research is someone looking into this right uh, so first things first so not my area of study or expertise having said that yes I do tend to look carefully at COVID and its fallout as a informed doctor so clearly COVID affected other organs including the heart the vaccine clearly had some impact uh, in terms of certain side effects. Uh, for example, a, a very well described syndrome called Whippet, where the, they would have uh, thrombosis. So there is clear evidence that this disease is thrombotic, causes thrombosis in body vessels. Yeah. About that, there's no debate. The question is, the deaths we see now, the sudden deaths, are all of them necessarily a, a outcome of that or connected to that. Uh, for this, we'll need a lot of strong data, uh, epidemiological data, which shows upswing in these deaths, etc. Et I think what is also happening is that sudden deaths, especially in celebrities, are being reported in the big way. Right. Now, whether that is information uh, bias, therefore we tend to think that people are dying suddenly, 
uh, out of the blue or it is related to COVID, that needs to be examined. So our sort of muddled um, treatment right now by various governments, state and centre, want to be seen as having done the best possible job during COVID, prevents us from being able to study what we did wrong to make sure it never happens again? Absolutely. And I think that is a tendency of any society, but perhaps even, even more so in India, where culturally somewhere we want to forget the negatives, uh, put up the positives at the cost of losing the opportunity to be reflective, learn the lessons and implement them. Uh, and that uh, came out hugely in COVID. That whilst there were heroes, there were individual heroes, there were people who worked very bravely, and we must, of course, uh, acknowledge that. But to put up that narrative and then sort of put down completely the narrative it said that look, people need people who died need not have died. So as somebody who worked in the healthcare system, I can tell you that there is no question that we had needless deaths during COVID. Individuals who, in the, especially in the Delta wave, who were in wards, which were, so we had, we overreacted to the isolation. People died not because of COVID, but because their tubes came out, because their ventilator clogged off, etc. Because of our fear and isolation that we promoted, you know, that you shouldn't go nowhere near the ward. You should, you have to necessarily, those who go in have to wear that whole space suit kind of thing. And as a result of which, there were so many needless deaths. So again, to learn the lesson, we're going to, I hope I'm wrong, but we're going to have more epidemics. So what are we going to learn from, from COVID? We're going to learn these things. And if we have we're reflective, objective about what happened, uh, we must acknowledge that we had needless deaths. Uh, people did not get care in time. And even when they got into hospitals, they went into these dark holes called isolation ICUs, where, uh, you know, uh, they were uh, very often they had collateral damage of being in isolation. So yes, we need to be so that balance as a as a society, where we I think I think it's something to do with uh, with uh, the scientific. Where is the center of gravity of our our scientific temper? Where is that center? I mean, there will be outliers on both sides, right? But where is that center of gravity? Has COVID improved our scientific temper or harmed it as a, as a society? Have we become more inclined to science or been driven in the opposite direction? Okay, so uh, it should have uh, improved our scientific temper. One hopes that it did. But the evidence is still perhaps weak. Uh, because uh, in our day-to-day -day healthcare, the primacy to evidence in the way we practice, one has not seen a big shift. So, for example, you know, the way we used medications in COVID, what were the processes we put in? Who decided whether they should be used? What was the, what was the, what are the protocols set by the, the government? What were the protocol? How what were, were they followed? If we should have learned many lessons there, yes. uh, but I don't see that happening. I hope I am wrong. Maybe down the line, some lessons must have been learned, will be learned, uh, because after all, it has been a big shock. But we need to see more evidence mm. of that. Dr. Nagral, thank you so much for giving me oh, your thank, time. Thank you, thank you, Faye, for being <laughs> back, back with you after a long time. And you know, uh, obviously, one remembers the days of uh, the 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, national news. So, thank you, thank you for uh, considering uh, me uh, worthwhile to spend this time with you. I, I don't know. Uh, I am a little intrigued and sort of, to use a cliched word, humble that you should choose to talk to me as a doctor who has. Uh, sort of uh, opinions on uh, on healthcare because i'm not that that <laughs> prominent uh, doctor but thank you for this opportunity thank you thank you for giving me your time thank you, thank you.